Well, thank you all for um, saying yes. Uh, we didn't know what kind of reaction we were going to get, so it was all quite fun when, uh, when you all suddenly started saying yes to us, which was great. Um, I know some of you very well, others not so well, so uh, I'm glad that you could be part of this. Um, it's slightly new for us at Dare Dallas. We've done lots of webinars over um, lockdown. Um, Colin was obviously very good about uh, sending out the samples. Unfortunately, I've not found a jewellery person that is willing to send diamonds yet, but I'm certainly <laughs> looking. <laughs> but that's probably more up my street than whiskey. <laughs> so if anybody knows anyone, they're happy to send out samples. You know, we're there. Um, but we thought it would be quite fun to get you guys involved. Um, Colin's going to tell you all about it. Uh, my knowledge of whiskey is very limited. Um, I don't suppose any of you caught the whiskey webinar that Colin and I did um, back in, I think it was in August, Colin. It was June. It was June. We were just recalling this, actually, because I, I, we were just saying that we obviously we recorded it and then there was some, some little issue and... Uh, you had to basically go through it with Colin again. <laughs> yes, I, I'd watched it on the Tuesday evening. Um, and then we basically had the recording that we were going to press go on, on the Thursday at two o'clock. And I pressed go and nobody could hear anything. Oh no. Um, of which Col I turned around to Colin and said, okay, Colin, we're gonna have to do it again. And do you remember that picture of that bottle that you first put up? Well, can you put that one up again? <laughs> I know can't so, find. <laughs> and it was really, really bad. But um, everybody, um, or fortunately, was in um, good spirits. And we got away with it and then sent out the recording, thank goodness. So I'm going to say thank you to you all um, for joining us. I'm going to pass over to Colin and Alistair, um, who know their stuff. And at some point, you may see me disappear. But I do hope to stay on for the whole of it um, while I'm still working. <laughs> so, uh, I think Colin, are you going, or is Alistair, are you going to mute everyone at some point, or do you want to? Uh, yeah, to... I mean, alternatively, if everyone could mute themselves, it saves me going through everyone individually and doing it. That would be great. Yeah. And then what we'll do is we will uh, just start off. Right. So, thanks ever so much, Rachel. And yeah. um, as, as Rachel pointed out, it's the first time we've we've done anything like this. So, just bear with us. There's going to be a few mistakes, and uh, don't don't worry about asking questions <laughs> that are somewhat deemed to be silly because no doubt by the second or the third whiskey the answers will probably be even more silly uh so so fear not on that front so before we get into the whiskey i'm going to make you sit around for about 20 minutes just to uh to have a brief chat with colin and uh, we're going to just discuss a few kind of aspects recently uh with the way the market's been going with whiskey so so recently colin um well, in fact, now let's not look at the market first. Let's, look, let's just have a little bit of a touch on the history of whiskey, just a brief history of it. And why do you think at the moment it's becoming so collectible? It's a, it's a very in-depth question. It's a webinar in its own right. But I think the answer to the history sort of plays into the, the, the collectible and the investment side of it as well. This is a product that has great heritage. It has always been associated with quality, much like champagne is protected by its regional um, sort of status scotch whiskey is similarly. So although whiskey is made all around the world and more so now than ever, with distilleries popping up in Israel, Sweden, Iceland, everywhere, um, it really has its heart in Scotland. Now the Irish would disagree with us and they're probably right in that there's slightly earlier historical records of it in Ireland and some of the more argumentative Scots would say they invented it and we perfected it but equally Irish, Irish whiskey is very good as well. So it's one of these things that it's like saying that only red wine from France is good and therefore others aren't, they're different. So that heritage and that, um, that sort of quality that goes throughout the whole aspect really gives collectors something to buy into and latch onto. It's much like a Rolex watch. There are better ones, there are more valuable ones, but that brand Rolex has that halo across the whole thing. Investors at the moment, collectors at the moment are looking for new asset classes, for different asset classes, and there is a new collector's buyer's base and a younger collector's buyer's base coming in. So where people might have in the past got to collecting stamps or toy soldiers and uh, things they remembered from their, 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 their past, they're looking for different things. And there's this idea that if it all goes wrong and the investment goes out the window, well, I can still drink it. And do that with my stocks and shares. So that's interesting, Colin. You, so you think you think the demographic has changed with regards to the people that collect it? 
it's a very young buyer's base compared to other markets. So when um, back in the 90s, when the sort of the boom began or a, or a noticeable boom began, obviously the internet's coming in at that point, you could still sell alcohol on eBay, which you can't do anymore um, unless you're a registered user, but the general public can, I should say. So there was a there was a trend coming in there. It's a market that's come through with the internet. So the earlier people in, I argue to say the younger younger generation, and it's something that it's different. People who collect anything collect something that's diff generally that's different to the generation before. And from an investment perspective and the collecting investment perspective, it doesn't go off in the bottle. So while wine changes in the bottle and becomes better, and then passes its peak and, and corks and goes off. Whiskey doesn't do that. If it's looked after and the steel seal stays intact, it stays as it was in the bottle. So it's a protected investment in that sense. Whereas the wine you have to get out of at some point, you have to drink it or sell it or somebody consumes it because it's going to go past the point of having any value at all. So that's a safety net. That's an idea that, well, I can keep this for 10 years or 20 years or 50 years and it's going to be okay. Whereas with the wine, there are good years and bad years. There are ones that last longer in the bottle and you've got to store them in a more controlled environment, whereas the whiskey is a more stable product, let's say. Do you think people are buying it or well, spending more money on bottles of whiskey to drink as well as investments? Obviously, you know, back in the 80s and the 90s, people, you know, were, were considering, you know, a 20, 30, 40 pound bottle of scotch to be, you know, relatively reasonable for a Saturday night at home. But now people are spending in the hundreds of pounds just for something to drink, aren't they? Absolutely. And it's this idea that the, the, the kind of the aura around whiskey has changed from being a cheap product that came from the supermarket that got people drunk on a park bench. And that was its job. It's now become a connoisseur's product. There's been a generation of um, people working in whiskey, brand ambassadors, a term that's banded around for everything nowadays, but in the whiskey sense started in the sort of 80s, 90s. Uh, who've educated the world that whiskey doesn't have to be that drink that got you absolutely smashed when you were 14 and you can't stand the smell of it anymore. It has a lot much like wine. There is bloody awful wine and there's really good wine. So it's about um, that understanding. And the education has been a huge part of that. And it really has changed people's perception. And equally, was it five or 10 years ago, cider was a drink that got people drunk. Then Magners reinvented it in a glass with ice and it became a fashionable drink. Prosecco now outsells um, cava and champagne combined because it's become a fashionable drink. The education, the taste, the palates have changed and it's got this new new kind of aura around it. Fantastic. Well, can I ask about the, um, uh, you talked about the bottled um, variety not changing, but those still in casks, there is some uh, evaporation or whatever that goes on. Is there a, a big sort of definition, sort of split between the, in the investment world between those who invest in the cask and those who invest in the bottle? Absolutely, and it's a very good question. When whiskey's in a bottle, I say it doesn't change. When whiskey goes into a cask, it goes in the color of gin. It goes in, it could be water for all it matters. It's the cask that imparts the color. So the second dram we'll get to tonight, when it came out in the full size bottle, is that color. It started off as my glass of water. So that's the influence the cask has. So what cask investors are looking for is a good cask. Not all casks are good. Some have been reused three, four, five times, maybe once for 10 years, twice for five years, and another five years. That's 25 years worth of whiskey taking the flavor out of the cask. Therefore, it's not going to impart again. So if whiskey went back into that cask again, it would take a lot more than 13 years that it took to do this, to do it a second time. So investing in casks is, is very exciting to people because you can buy a product when it's quite young. If you've got the in, uh, investment strategy to wait for a long time, it will be obviously becomes older. Generally, older whiskey is worth more than younger whiskey. Therefore, it's worth more money. It's not as simple as that, as you've got to really understand the cask itself. What, are you, what kind of cask it is? How often has it been used? Not all whiskey ages well in casks. Some whiskey is much nicer, much fresher, much tastier at a younger age than at an older age. And there's a point where it tips over. So if it's in the cask too long, it's sort of um, the wood, the influence from the wood takes over and the spirit influence dies off. And I've used this analogy many times. If you put a tea bag in your favorite mug of tea with hot water on, after 30 seconds, it's not a great cup of tea. After three minutes, it's lovely. After 10 minutes, you don't want to drink it. So that's happening with the whiskey. 
in the cask. So getting out the cask is as important as keeping it in the cask at the right time. Um, from a tax perspective, there are very different taxes when it comes to casks and bottles. So at the moment, I don't think this will last forever, but at the moment, casks in Britain are not subject to capital gains because they're considered a wasting asset. They have a life, an expected lifespan of under 50 years because they're evaporating, they're losing alcohol, they're losing volume. So it, it would, in theory, the, the industry averages between two and 3% of volume a year. So something that goes in at 100% when it comes out 50 years later, in theory, doesn't exist. Now, it's not as simple as that. Casks are this magical thing that some lose a lot of liquid, some lose a lot of, and some are much tighter. So there's no standard rule. Um, so in theory, there's no capital gains on that. As soon as you put that into bottle and you sell the bottles, then there's, there's tax implications. And if you were to collect bottles and sell them um, as down the line, then again, that's not a wasting asset as wine would be considered because it's in a bottle and it's not changing. So we sort of come full circle on that, on that story. So very different aspects and all have their pitfalls. Um, it's, it's not a simple thing. The whiskey market, if you look at the graphs, has done that over the last 20 years. But if you look at things in a more, you know, um, strict way, you can see that certain distilleries have done very well or certain bottlings have done very well and others haven't. So it's not this, buy whiskey now, it's worth lots of money later on necessarily. There are great stories of people you know, buying whiskey and finding the back of the cupboard or being given it and all of a sudden they're thousands of pounds better off than they thought they were. But I won't spoil that story till we get to the slide about that one. <laughs> Colin, let's um, let's move on to some of some good examples here of, of clearly the type of thing that you you purchase to drink. Um, let's have a look at the uh, the first bottle, which is the 1926 Macallan that came up last month at Whiskey Auctioneer. Now let's make sure my screen my screen sharing works because that is always a challenge. Here we go, it works. So we were talking about investments and why people buy whiskey and what they buy and the value and whatnot. So this is the classic example. This is the most arguably one of the most valuable bottles of whiskey in the world. Uh, this was distilled in 1926 by Macallan in Speyside, who are the Rolls Royce of, of collectible whiskies. It was bottled in 1986, and I believe when it was bottled, you could get a bottle for, I think it was under £2,000, £2,900, £3,000, let's say. The oldest whiskey ever bottled at that point, the earliest whiskey ever bottled, i.e. the distillation date, and just an amazing thing. The only had about 20 to 30 bottles. They put some into fancy artistic labels. They did some in this, which is called the fine and rare range. And it just took off. This was the beginning of whiskey collecting, yeah. beginning of whiskey um, investment. Oddly, they couldn't sell them all quickly. Um, and they still had some on the shelves a few years later. Now everyone's kicking themselves at their time. <laughs> this bottle sold for equal, basically equaling the world record, inclusive of buyer's premium, so for just over 1.2 million pounds. Uh, of weeks ago. Um, the record is 1.5 million for one with a slightly different label, but the same liquid in there. So you've got the blue chip. This is the, you know, the best Ferrari, the best Monet painting. This is the finest house in Belgrave Square. This is the, the one. So this is what they all go for. Why it's worth that? It's worth that because there are very few bottles of it. It is considered the ultimate. And if you are a collector that has to have one of everything and you have the, the means and the value and the wealth to do it, this is what you have to have. And it's solid. Talking about it being the best and talking about it being the, the pinnacle of whiskey. If there were so few made, how do people know? Very good question. Marketing, obviously, is a key thing. <laughs> All the tick boxes. It comes in a nice wooden box and a fancy label. No, it is coming from an extraordinarily early point of distillation. Whiskey at this point was not made to be kept. It was made to be drunk. It wasn't bottled and distilled to be sold as a single malt. Most of it went into blends or was sold by local shops. So in 1926, the shop down the road from here would have got a cask in and you'd have gone in with your own bottle and filled it up and been charged by the bottle. So it wasn't meant to survive. So it's a rarity factor. Um, the be best is probably a term I use, which is wrong. It's it's the most wanted. That's that's really the key. So in the pre-war years, then were were people around this region drinking the finest whiskey known to man? They were drinking this when it was much younger. This is the point. This has been in the cask for sixty years. So they would have, this would have been at four or five years old. It'd be going to blends. It'd been drunk as a malt, and it just would have been the standard at the time. Um, 
but because it laid undisturbed in this cask for 60 years, it stayed above the alcohol proof level. Another thing with casks, if the alcohol goes below 40%, then legally it's not whiskey, it becomes a liqueur. So and another reason, you can't keep casks forever. You can't buy a cask at 10 and say, I'll keep it till 50. It may not stay within those regions. So it's a remarkable survival. Whiskey shouldn't survive 60 years in the cask if it's losing on average 2% of its volume of alcohol a year. So it's that rarity and that remarkable idea. And because Macallan is the most collectible whiskey in the world, this therefore sits atop that pinnacle. Is it going to go up? I don't know. But the last three that have sold have sold very much around the same price. So unless we get new buyers coming into the market, um, then it sounds like it's found its level. But equally, there was bottles of this sold for 20, 30,000 pounds in the 90s and folk thought it would never go any higher. So, you know, it's from 3,000 in 1986 to 1.2 million in 2021. That is outstanding. I mean, un it's remarkable. I mean, I can't- is there, any, is there any trace of how many are left? It's known that one got destroyed in the Japanese earthquake 10, 15 years ago. There, uh, there's a known empty bottle in, on the continent somewhere. I can't remember exactly where. And it's believed, this is slight fable, but it's believed in about 2006, 2008, um, when the Russian boom and the, and, the, and the wealth in Russia was exploding, uh, a Russian oligarch went to one of the greatest whiskey retailers in the world who had a complete collection of fine and rare. This was one of maybe 25, 35 bottles um, and said he wanted to buy the collection. And the guy said, well, it's going to cost you one and a half million pounds. And he said, fine, he paid for it. And they were all opened for his daughter's 21st birthday. So. Gosh. Well. <laughs> so, hey, not one I was invited to, sadly, not many <laughs> right Right. Let, let's move on to the next one, Colin, which is the, the Linkwood, isn't it? Can we can we get that picture up? So here, here we have, now are you seeing that picture on screen now? That move? Yeah, that's good. So here we have really what would, could be argued as one of the earliest bottles of whiskey to survive. Now there are a few at this late 18, 1890s period, so I'm not saying this is the oldest, but to find a bottle of whiskey distilled or bottled round about 1900 is just the holy grail. It just doesn't exist. Um, because they weren't bottled necessarily for sale, they were sold, as I said before, in shops into your own bottle, which you brought with you, it means that they were bought to drink. Again, corks weren't as good quality, capsules and closures weren't as good quality, and there's been lots of special occasions between 1898 and today to crack it open at a family party. So they just don't exist. So Linkwood is a very good Speyside whiskey, very highly regarded, not an expensive one, but a really lovely um, whiskey to have. What we have here, as you see on the bottom of the label, in the last three lines, it says Ian Grant & Co, London and Glasgow. This is saying that it wasn't bottled by the distillery. So the Macallan was bottled by the distillery. This was bottled by a bottler who obviously was based in London and Glasgow and sold to his market. So these bottles are extremely rare when they turn up, uh, or bottles of this type, I should say, so they're extremely rare. When they turn up, there's always questions about, about authenticity and the research into who were these merchants, who were these shops starts, is the bottle itself of the period, is the closure, the cap, the, the cork on the top of the period, is the paper of the period, all gives us answers. But sit recently, they've been developed by a university in Glasgow, uh, basically a carbon dating test. And what's happened to this bottle before the gentleman who sold it last month bought it, uh, they, they, they took the, the closure off because it was, it was degrading and they put a needle straight through the cork and remove a tiny amount, a, cup, a mil or two mil of whiskey, and they can test that to radiocarbon dating. And from that, they can't tell you it's liquid, but what they can tell you is that it's a pure malt whiskey or it's a blended whiskey. So again, that helps determine if what's on the label is correct. And they can give a date, a rough date of, of distillation within a few year period. So does the date of the carbon dating match up with the date on the label, the date of the bottler, the date of the bottle, all these things. And this had that done, proved to be malt of that period and an extremely, extremely rare thing. Um, and yeah. Has it suffered a bit from the ullage is on there is obviously it's, um, it, it's reduced a little, hasn't it? Absolutely. So the alcohol volume's not stated on it today. Bottles of whiskey have to tell you what the percentage of alcohol in, it, in them is. That period, it wasn't a concern. So it doesn't tell you what the alcohol was. They're probably relatively strong. 
Um, but as you say, it's come down in the level, the ullage has come down in the bottle, so it's lost some of the alcohol. It's usually the alcohol that's lost rather than the liquid. So the alcohol can evaporate out, whereas the liquid stays in. That's another reason they've resealed it at the top with this rather unsightly red wax, just to keep it absolutely enclosed in. Um, and that's, that's key, obviously. Quite a lot of people got caught out, not with great fortunes lost, thankfully, but there was a great craze for ceramic decanters. Royal Dalton and Wade and other people did them. Some were malt, some were quite good malt, some were blends. The problem with the ceramic decanter is the foot rim isn't blazed because it would stick to the kiln when it's being fired. Mm. The alcohol can evaporate out of the foot rim. So you can pick up these sealed decanters and there's about, uh, you know, 40% of them's lost because the alcohol's all disappeared. I didn't know that. that, that that's incredible. Wow. Wow. That, 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 that's, that's remarkable, isn't it? Um, let's move on to the next one, because I know people are uh, chomping at the bit to get into the, the lovely drums that we've got, actually. Well, this is an interesting one, oh. and one that really I just put in just to show it's not all about things you might expect. And, and I saw this bottle selling a couple of weeks ago, and it made £5,000, which compared to the Macallan's not a lot. But compared to other bottlings by Arthur Bell, the whiskey connoisseur, as he calls himself on the label, it's a fortune. His bottles are not that highly regarded. They're not that rare. Um, but this one, for some reason, and I didn't understand why, I must admit, was making 5,000, I would have expected, say, 400, 500 pounds. So we're, you know, we're 10 times out, out there. We're kind of in the realm here, Colin, of something that potentially somebody would buy to drink. Now, if they buy that and drink it, are they honestly going to say, my word, this is this is 10 times better than a bottle of, of 500 pound whiskey? If you like it and it's your style, then maybe. This is the thing with whiskey, that with the style of whiskey, you know, I was talking to a friend today who really doesn't like peated whiskey and I love whiskey, he really likes smooth Speyside whiskey. So he wouldn't thank you for a fantastic Isla and he'd rather have a 20, 30 pound Speyside, even though you know, the disparity on value is there. But if you like a really nice, clean space side on a, from a bourbon cask, so it's got really nice fruity flavors. This was distilled in 1966. So that is quite a long time ago in terms of whiskey, but at 28 years old, bottling, again, is a nice thing. The reason this made the money was there are one or two websites of independent whiskey specialists who taste whiskey and whose opinion is, is really given the highest regard because they're completely impartial to distillery and to brand. This was, was sampled a few years ago by one of these um, one of these specialists, and he gave it, I think it was 96 points out of 100. So on the scale of high quality whiskey, that really takes the box. So in other words, our whiskey connoisseur here, Mr. Bell, either bought really cleverly and got a great cask or really luckily and got a great cask. <laughs> That's the difference is when you're talking about single cask whiskey, which the Macallan was and this is and the next slides won't be, it's a real true expression of whiskey from one cask, not from one distillery, not from one year, but from one cask. And as we said at the beginning, what the cask gives to that whiskey changes. So you can have two whiskies from the same distillery, both single cask, aged in the same amount of time in the same type of cask, and they can taste like chalk and cheese. And that's the difference. So this, to, to some collectors who really collect by these rating systems and go for anything over 90 for argument's sake, this is a really important thing. This is a really rare whiskey to find. And they've decided that 5,000 pounds is what they're willing to pay. Um, amazing. I mean, it's a, a record for his, for, his, um, for his bottlings by a long way. Now, this next one we're gonna look at is, I think we were discussing this earlier, and it's the type of thing that you could have a few years ago actually go into your local Waitrose or Oddbins and go and buy off the shelf. So what's, what's actually made it become, it's, it's, it's a hell of a colour as well, but what's actually made it become such a classic, a classic whiskey? This is the story that our time machine would take us all back to, I think. Or that, or the, after we got our Macallan 1926, as I should. But this is Bowmore, which is a classic Isle of Whiskey, really traditional at the time, was making small production, really hands on. So not, not craft distilling like a craft baker's on the high street, but really slow, properly old fashioned made whiskey. They have these legendary warehouses, warehouse number one and number two, that are the oldest whiskey warehouses in the world. And technically, they sit below sea level right on the coast so the foundations are in so it's a really cool environment it's not changing temperature in the summer so the whiskey ages very slowly very calmly 
and it takes a long time to do what it does. There were three or four casts of these 1964 sherry casts that were called the Black Bomo. This is all natural colour. This is something that when you go to the supermarket to buy whiskey and you say you like a uh, Glenlivet 12-year-old or you like a uh, Glenelgy or whatever, it's always the same colour because they make sure of that, because you as the consumer want to know what you're going to purchase, wants to taste the same every time and be the same colour, much like a Mars bar is the same colour or, or anything you get in the supermarket. This is, the, this is different. This is natural colour, all come from the cask. Remarkable. You don't see that often. And certainly at 42 years old, a very, very old bottling for Bowmore. So it's distilled in 1964, bottled 42 years later, so early 2000s, uh, 2002. And it was sold mainly, not only, but mainly in duty-free and through odd bins. Odd bins was a huge alcohol buying concern at that bankrupt now, but huge alcohol buying concern at the time. And it was £350 a bottle. And it was a lot of money. Uh, would be nothing. For whiskey today, 42 year old whiskey today now would be tens of thousands, no matter you know, pretty much what it was. But that was the market at the time. We were in a market that didn't appreciate single cask, didn't understand single cask, and still whiskey was that drink that got you drunk sort of idea. The collectors, it got, because it was at a, a price people could afford to buy, it got drunk and it was amazing. I've never tried it, I should add. I wish I had. Apparently, it is just the, the, the be all and end all. It just takes every single box going. And it got that reputation. It was very small numbers. It was very limited release and they got drunk. So they're getting rarer and rarer all the time. So at its peak, this was making £30,000 a bottle. And Gosh, you, wow. You could have bought it on the high street. That's re This is not in-depth connoisseur knowledge found it in a, in a distillery on an island nobody would heard of. This was on your high street. This is the amazing thing. Colin, I'm going to say one word to you and you can tell me whether you think this is true or not. Hype. Do you think some of these things get to these prices because of hype? Absolutely. Um, I think you could say that about many luxury brands and luxury products. Um, you could have that argument about a good Prosecco is better than a, than a standard champagne, but the mm -hmm. price differential is there. So rarity obviously plays a part in any value. Hype plays a part, but also when you consider that this whiskey was distilled in 1964 and laid to rest for 42 years before the distiller could make his profit out of it. It's a remarkable thing. And that is what goes on. I think with this whiskey of this quality, the hype is less because it can back itself up. What we're seeing at the moment is lots of new distilleries that were built and opened three, four years ago are putting their new first release whiskey out there. Whiskey isn't whiskey until it's three years old in a day. So they're all putting out three-year-old whiskey to get money back in. You know, this is a business they've made no money for three years unless they've been making hand sanitizer this year and last year or making gin or doing tours. So they've waited three years to make a decent profit and they put this whiskey out there. And there was an example recently, Nick Neen Distillery and on the coast, west coast of Scotland, wholly organic, wholly renewable, lovely story. Not tried the whiskey, heard it's good, but it's three years old, so it's going to be good, not great they put 10 bottles into auction for charity, the first 10 bottles that they were doing. And they are they were going to be released, and everyone knew this, they were going to be released on general sale six weeks later in all the usual places, Amazon, Whiskey Exchange, Master Malt, and they'd be about £80 a bottle, and which is fair. You know, this is a new product, interesting. The high, highest price, bottle number one of the 10 that were sold, made £40,000. Gosh. went down from 40,000 to about 8,000 pounds for an 80 quid dram, as I would call it. <laughs> it hype. Now it was for charity, so that's, that's lovely and that's really good, but that is hype. That is not 60, 42 year old whiskey in the finest sherry cask that sat next to the Queen's cask for 30 years. You know, that's, that's, that's amazing. Equally, the 80 pound bottles were, were savagely bought at, at all the retail places that could be could have got at, and they're now selling for three or four hundred pounds because every collector wants that first. So what Nick Neen think is a profitable bottle at 80 quid and is probably a drinking whiskey at 80 pounds is now being traded and hoarded and collected and all these things at three, four hundred pounds, which is remarkable. Absolutely. Remarkable. And that is hype, obviously. Gosh, no, it, it, it's, it, it's amazing, isn't it? Absolutely amazing. Now, let's let's have a look at something which is obviously quite close to your heart, Colin, and possibly quite close to what we're going to actually be looking at in a little while. So let's move on to the next. Absolutely. Image. So this is a 
1990s bottling of standard 10-year-old Brookladi, which is an Isla single malt. Um, it was always a very popular, well-regarded Isla distillery on the island. It wasn't that well known as a malt. Most of it went to blends. We must remember that even today, about 90% of malt whiskey that's made goes into blends. Blends are what sell. And it's, Have there ever been any collectible blends just off the top of your head? There are. No, people do collect them. Things like Johnny Walker have a great status and the, the early Johnny Walkers and the higher, higher release ones now do. And again, blends, if you go to a supermarket cheap blend today, if you're lucky, it'll be 90% grain, 10% malt. So not great. Johnny Walker, I think, is about 50-50 or 60-40 malt, malt to grain. So much, much higher quality product in there. And also, the some of the early Johnny Walkers have some remarkable malts in there and are apparently very good drams. So it's, again, it's, there is this snobbery, this, again, I keep going back to Champagne and Prosecco, but they, they're not that different. You know, there, there are good blends and, and there are terrible blends, and there are good malts and there are terrible malts. Right. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you there. We're, we're back, back to the first so, yeah, Brookladdy had been a big constitute blend. It had been owned by various distillers. It had been closed a couple of times because it was surplus to requirements. It was finally closed in the early 90s by White and Mackay, who do a lot of blending as well as have a lot of malts, including Dalmore and Jura. Um, and it was a kind of a death nail to part of the island community. Uh, you know, everybody who lived in, lived in Brookladdy worked at Brookladdy Distillery, you know, from, from the bookkeeper to the caskman to the maltman to the warehouse keeper. People were, you know, living on the island because of it. It closed. It was a great stress to that area of the island. And it was a lovely whiskey. It just wasn't one that had been marketed. This was after the oversaturation in the 80s in the market where there was overproduction. So there was more stock than was needed. So closing distilleries made financial sense. And it lay undisturbed, basically falling to bits, rotting away. Nothing was done. They, somebody swept the floors every now and then and checked. Nobody was filthing out the warehouse. And it just, there was holes in the roof, the stills were just left to rot, the mash tons, the, you know, got infested, the mice got in, as you can imagine. But in the early 2000s, late 1990s, early 2000s, um, a wine merchant from London, Mark Rainier, who had a great family history in wine, was given a dram of this, pretty much this exact bottle to try, and just thought it was amazing. And he thought whiskey was a drink that people drank to get drunk, and it was rough, and it was awful, and he could taste things in this, this whiskey that he related back to wine, that fruitiness, that flavor, that smoothness, that complexity. And he thought to himself, why have I never heard of this? What is this, you know, Brookladdy? And he went on a journey to find out. He and his brother cycled, they got to Glasgow and then cycled from Glasgow to Isla, I think I'm right in saying, to go and visit Brookladdy Distillery. Got there, the gates were locked and the sign said, we're closed, go home. Visitors not welcome. <laughs> and somebody through the gate, he saw and he said, oh, I explained his situation and his pilgrimage. And he said, no, no, we're shut, you know, sling your hook. And that was that. And he was, he decided that was that. He was going to buy the distillery and he was going to open it and he was going to go for it. So in 2001, uh, he put together a team of private investors, all private people, and they decided they should speak to somebody who understood whiskey. And they spoke to Jim McEwen, who's a name that is very well regarded and well known in whiskey. Um, and said to Jim, who was distillery manager at Bowmore and had been there since 1957 in various roles, man and boy, and said to Jim, Mr. McEwen, uh, would you consider opening Brookladdy? And he said within two minutes, he'd said yes. He said, do you not want to check? Do you not want to think? He said, no, I'm going to do it. He'd, when you're at Bowmore on the island, you look across the bay and there's Brookladdy, the sleeping, the sleeping princess, they used to call it, of Isla. And he thought, this is a crime. It was a great dram. Everyone knew it was a great whiskey. And he, they took it on to, re, to recreate that spirit, to reinvigorate the distillery, and to reinvigorate the island. And to fast forward, I'll rewind slightly and say, but to fast forward to today, they're now the biggest employer on Isla, employing over 85 people. It's all made and produced on the island. It's bottled on the island. They also invented the botanist gin, which is one of the biggest selling gins in Britain as well. And it has revitalized, reinvigorated and revitalized, I should say, the islands. The, the schools are full, the doctor surgeries are full, the houses are full, all because of, as they say on the island, an Englishman's passion for whiskey, a wine merchant's passion for whiskey. And this is the bottle that started that, that, that journey. 
it, it, it's a fascinating town, and obviously we're, we're all going to thoroughly enjoy uh, sampling some Brooklady in a minute. But there, there has to be some kind of point, though, Colin, with, with people and collections of whiskey, where you must see that when you're going to establish, you know, valuations on these things, that they, they clearly, they don't know what they've got. We see it all the time, obviously, in the valuations that we do, be it with art, be it with watches, be it with jewellery. Um, and there still must be that kind of range of people that have bought things. And, and clearly, as, as you said, with things that were purchased maybe from odd bins 20 odd years ago for, for a few hundred quid as a, as a nice Christmas present, maybe, that are still sitting there. Does that still happen? The Christmas present or the wedding anniversary hmm. is exactly the story. There's a classic whiskey, which was the Macallan 25-year-old that was called the Anniversary Malt. And it came in a lovely wooden box, a bit like a packing crate box. And it was, I think it was 75, 80 pounds a bottle. So for your parents' go silver wedding anniversary or your 25th birthday or your 50th birthday, it was a great bottle. It was affordable and it looked great and people were given it. And it was given as a gift. It was given with, 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 with love and it was too good to open. It was too good for, for a Friday night. So it was kept for a special occasion and got pushed to the back of the cupboard. That special occasion never comes. You find it in 10 years, you Google it, and you go, oh, crikey, it's £1,200 now. It's far too good to drink. I can't drink it now. And, of course, that market's gone up and up and up. And that, that anniversary malt, there are various variations, but minimally is £2,000. It could be five or £6,000, depending on the vintage. And it's not people that have necessarily Aston Martins and Ferraris in the garage and huge stock portfolios and 25-bedroom houses that have these. It can be people that were buying them in Tesco's and odd bins. So this is not something necessarily that is for the high net worth client that we, we often put our marketing to, as Rachel says, with the jewellery and, and the paintings, as you point out. And the insurance of it, obviously, is important. The, you know, this is a glass bottle. This is something that can, can be damaged quite easily. Um, I did an evaluation for a client recently. Um, they'd had a bottle that had opened. The heating in the storeroom they had it in had made the alcohol swell and it had popped the top of the cork out and about five mil, so less than you, about what you've got in your sample kits in front of you had spilled out. And because the seal had been broken, the bottle is now worthless. You cannot sell an open bottle of whiskey because you cannot guarantee the contents. It's still a consumable, even at a million pounds. So his 25,000 pound bottle of whiskey was now worth nothing. So the insurance on that is key. And mm -hmm. as I mentioned um, to you as well. So the casks, a very good question earlier on about the casks. Speaking to clients about casks is key. Uh, casks are always valuable. There's no such thing as a cheap cask, no matter what's in it or what age. And most clients tell me their casks are insured. And I say, okay, what are they insured for? And they don't have an answer to that. And when they look at their document from the, from the warehouse, because it has to be stored in a, in a government bonded warehouse, um, what it's actually insured for, it, generally, there are exceptions, obviously, but the majority are insured for if there's a disastrous incident where the cask falls over, a forklift truck smashes into it, the insurance value is based on what the government will demand for the duty, not on what the whiskey itself is worth. So in a litre bottle of whiskey at a standard percentage, it might be 12 to 15 pounds of, whiskey, of, of duty is payable, but the whiskey could be worth 25,000 pounds. So the value of their asset, the value of their whiskey is not insured. It's the government's loss of getting its duty that is insured. So they're not actually paying insurance for what they think they are in a lot of cases. And that's something that I've come across time and time again. That's interesting. We're talking about the cask and if a cask gets damaged, is there any value to the actual cask, the physical wood and metal of the cask? If you can find the 1926 Macallan cask, then there are a lot of collectors out there who'd like to put their million pound bottle on it. Otherwise, if it's been without whiskey in it, let's say, or more than a year or so, they've dried out past the point of being reused. So they then become garden planters and bar stools. But if it's had whiskey taken out of it, um, you can always put whiskey back in as long as you're quick enough. Um, and then you can age your whiskey in it again. So there is a secondary value within the trade, but that's not something really that, that private people can get involved in because it's obviously based on large numbers in warehouses. And things like that. Amazing. Well, Colin, that's been absolutely fascinating as expected and uh, lots of fun. But I think uh, it, it's about time that we, uh, we, we actually get into the kit. And for those of you that haven't received it, I, I do apologise. I know there's been COVID in post offices and uh, all manner of, of, of small issues that I think some people have overcome. But those who haven't received their kits, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And you can just kind of imagine, I suppose, what we're drinking and, uh, and, and hopefully enjoy it from that kind of perspective. But Colin. Perspective. Colin, can I 
Rachel. Can I just ask you, as somebody that's not a whiskey drinker, I, and I can't imagine that we would be going into clients' homes and suddenly raiding their um, drinks cabinets. <laughs> Do you believe there are a lot of bottles out there that people don't realise they own? Absolutely. There was an example. Um, my parents live in Speyside uh, in the shadow of Macallan, where these million pound bottles hail from. And there was a gentleman, an old boy, real old boy, died in his 90s. He'd worked for the distilleries all his years and didn't drink a lot of whiskey, which is pretty rare. Um, and they were given every month bottles. They got staff discount. He bought collectible ones. But of course, he wasn't somebody that understood the Internet. He didn't understand. that the He knew the market was going up. It's all the talk in the pub and all that. And he shoved them in the attic. And when he died, his family didn't really know they were there. And his grandson was sent up to help Granny clean the attic before she moved out. And they found what turned out was auctioned. And it turned out to be £482,000 worth of <gasps> They didn't know they had. Oh, bless him. So, How much do you think he had earned whilst working there, Colin? <laughs> his, house, his house wasn't worth a quarter of that, so that gives you a clue, honestly. Uh, the house would have been 120, 150 grand, and the whiskey was 480,000 pounds. Gosh. So that, that's telling you how little he put into it financially. I mean, we obviously are made aware of wine collections and things like that when we're going out doing valuations. It's very rare that we have somebody that'll you know, say, oh, I've got X amount of thousand pounds in whiskey. Do you think that's something that we should be asking? I think, I think everybody should. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming I'm seeing a face, faces of brokers here. And yes, because you have a client there that isn't insuring their assets as, as well as they could be. They may not understand that. And of course, that's what we mean about the market having moved so much. Even those that think they know what they're doing with the casks being insured, they are insured, but not for what they think they're insured against. So, so in other words, the bonded warehouse is not insuring it for what they need to have it insured for. Exactly. I have clients who've got casks that are worth, one client's got a cask that is valued at about £100,000 and it's insured by the bonded warehouse for £3,000 because that's the, that's the level of duty they would be liable to pay if they were yeah. to cash the cask. So he's, he's completely, he's, he's insured for 3% of the value that he won't get, the, the government will get. It's insuring him against not being able to pay the £3,000 um, uh, duty fee. So yes is the answer. Um, it comes down to, I've been in houses before, businessmen who don't drink whiskey, who are at all these dinners and golf meetings and their wives are getting them. And gifts, and, and they just, gifts. Christmas I remember my, gifts. I remember my dad got, you know, was constantly given bottles of whiskey. Exactly. Whether um, I think he drank most. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the thing: is that it's 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 hard to ask a client what don't you know, what do you have you don't know is valuable. But as valuers, that's our job to go in and ask the question. And and when we go for renewal as clients, it's a question that is not a silly one to ask. And when you consider, as as we say. You could have bought these investments in odd bins. This is not going to Harrods, Fortnum and Masons. This is not going to um, the poshest shops you can think of. This yeah. was available in Tesco's and odd bins. Uh, you know, the, the classic bottle is um, Macallan 10 year old. My dad uh, used to buy it by the case and they had a cupboard in the office full of it because it was a great whiskey. It was 35, 40 pound a bottle. They gave it to every client who came across the door. There was always one open in the house. That's now £350 a bottle. And he must have given oh, okay. thousands of them over his career. And yeah. people that were, had done them a small fate, the window cleaner got one at Christmas. So again, it's this idea that it's not the Ferrari in the driveway makes we, we, we makes us think we should ask about the wine in the cellar. It's anybody. It's so obviously all of you are sitting here watching this. And how many of you, if you can raise your hand, I mean, I know Simon and I know John, um, Lumley both like their whiskey. So how are you all whiskey connoisseurs? Do you all have bottles in your cupboards that are worth more than let's say a hundred pounds? There's lots of nods. Okay. I would oh, say more than a hundred pounds. Oh, it's an empty one. Frank, but <laughs> so and tell me, so I are you honest about what you're spending on whiskey or is it like me with a pair of shoes and running up the stairs and, and hoping it's not seen? Are you Always all getting, 
you're all getting whiskey delivered and it's rather expensive and uh, <laughs> you don't tell the other half it, or am I just maybe it's just me <laughs> <laughs> Definitely silence there, Rachel. Um, yeah, so happens in my house. So. <laughs> I think I'm I'm interested. In, I've just started to become interested in in whiskey, having collected wine for since about 2009, um, and wine's kind of seems to run its course a little. Um, and I'm just becoming interested in whiskey, and I, I'm sort of dipping in at 70 or 100 pound a bottle just to just to drink and see if I like it. Um, this, is, this is it. What would be your sort of recommendation for a nice drinker? Sort of the fifty to seventy pounds seems to have become. There's so much of it now; it's difficult to get through fifty the, to the, quid. The whole market's dra dragged itself up. There's not a thirty pound bottle of whiskey anymore, not malt whiskey at least. Um, so the whole market's dragged itself on. Therefore, everybody's coming up with. That. So there are some standby classic drams that you can't go wrong with, and. Some of these you'll like, some of them you won't like, and it doesn't mean they're bad, it just means they're not for you. Like some people like a hot curry, some people like a, an Italian, it doesn't matter. So if we start with Isla, uh, where we'll go with our tasting shortly, Lagavulin 16 year old is, uh, Phil likes Lagavulin, <laughs> and is just a cracking classic mix of sherry and bourbon cask Isla. It's an absolute belter, it's just a go-to dram for anybody, absolutely superb. Lefroig and Ardbeg are that much harsher peated. <laughs> Phil's going to love this taste. <laughs> um, I must say that much... Lefroig would be my choice, actually. I think Lefroig is, 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 is yeah, my choice. The Lefroig <laughs> quarter <laughs> cask is worth it. Is Lefroig PX cask choice? is also really good. If you can get is it. Is there a club to join, Colin? Sorry, Rachel, say again. Is there a club? That you could join if there you are want. there are lots of there are various online um clubs now that do sort of drinks by the dram so you you subscribe for the month and you get three or four okay. um sachets or miniatures through the post which is a great go, Paul. Yeah. um yeah. scotch malt whiskey society um was one of the earliest clubs it was started in edinburgh in 1983 i think by a group of enthusiastic whiskey drinkers that wanted to get the single cask experience they were getting at distillery tours, but you couldn't get in the shops. That's now all changed. I would argue they've bottled some amazing whiskies over the years, but they are producing so much at the moment that their, their, their output is variable. Um, therefore, in the old days, any of their bottles were just lovely. They're doing 10 or 12 a month now, at least in some cases. Having said that, their blended malts are getting really high reviews at the moment um, because they're managing to keep that consistency up. If you move over to Speyside, um, classic supermarket dram for me is Aberlour 10 year old. It should only be about 30 pounds a bottle. It's absolutely superb. Getting up into your 50 to 70 pound mark. Um, the Glenfarclas, I've never had a bad Glenfarclas. It's an absolutely traditional family run, what used to be called a farm distillery. They do a 105, which is a cask strength, which is lovely. Their 25-year-old is under £100 if you're lucky, or 120 if you're not. Bear in mind, a Macallan 25-year-old would be 2000 2500 so above your budget, but I'm giving you, you know, a good reason why. Tandu is superb. You know, there's lots of good drinks out there. Thank you. Thank you very much. Can I ask, can I ask you about my, my favourite one, which is Scapa? Scapa is a completely overlooked gem. Uh, Scapa was made for many, many years. It was only bottled by Glenn, uh, by Gordon McPhail and independent bottlers. They had a contract to do the bottling. Very, very small run. Chivas use it in a lot of their um, very high quality blends. It's a really smooth drinking whiskey. It, they've realized the market for it is there and they're releasing um, some standard editions now and some small batch 50 CL bottles as well, which are getting great reviews. I've not tried many, but great reviews. If you can get your hands on the old Scapa 16, which is in a nice blue carton, 16, 14, 14, 14, sorry, Scapa 14, it should be about £120 a bottle. It is knockout. Um, that's my highest rating. It's got the cheap one. It's got the cheap one. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. They don't do a bad one. Again, it's, you've got to remember these big distilleries, these big brands, Diageo, Chivas, they don't produce a bad whiskey. Their, their reputation's not worth it. They've got the stocks that even in a young whiskey, they can, they can blend other whiskies, all malt, all from the same distillery. And this is, this is going to lead me very nicely into tasting some whiskey.
let's pop dram number one in a glass. That'll remind me we're here to drink, not just chat. Yeah. <laughs> what we have today, though, is not, not supermarket drams at all. These three are all single cask. So these have come straight from the cask. Any of you who've got little black bits in them, that's yep. that means they've not been filtered. That's the charcoal from the inside of the cask that's giving the flavor. That won't do any harm at all. And they're non-chill filtered. Now, chill filtration is standard in the in the in the in the whiskey industry and in spirits industry, because it removes the sort of fatty um, liquid, sort of residue that comes from the barley. If you imagine the bottle of olive oil in your cupboard, when it gets colder in the winter, it goes cloudy, and that's just the fatty acids, um, the fatty sort of congealing. Absolutely natural. You don't want that in, the, in on the shelf in the shops. So they want a nice, consistent product. They also don't want it to go cloudy when you put water in, so they take all that out. Now, what I suggest is Alistair did cheat, or I helped Alistair cheat, I should say, and said, get these glasses, Alistair. You want to look like a pro. He's making one mistake already, though. And he's Am got, I holding it wrong? He's got his fingers on the glass. You want to try and keep I, the glass clean if you can, because you're going no to... No fingers on the glass. Tumbler. If you tilt the glass to one side, put your finger in the top, and just spin the glass round, 360 degrees or more doesn't matter just make sure you go all the way around and then look at that whiskey don't look at the glass look at there's a line of whiskey just there because this isn't chill filtered that is holding there that is not running down the glass that is stuck on my glass there's little beads forming but they're not dropping down they're absolutely clinging to the glass there you take your finger or i shall do it see <laughs> There's a drop on my finger that will stay there for hours, if I could be bothered. It will stay there for hours. That liquid, that, that, those fattiness that is there, it's absolutely fantastic. Think about that fingers being your tongue. Think about the side of the glass being your tongue. This means the flavor is going to stay on your, in your mouth, in your palate. It is fantastic. Is so, this because of the viscosity of it, Colin, or because of the absolutely. alcohol content? No, it's the viscosity. It's coming from the natural oils, the fatty oils from the barley. So when you distill barley, you, so you mash the barley, which is to make the beer, then becomes distilled to become the whiskey. You're keeping those natural oils in there. This is all natural product. This is non-chill filtered, as we say, natural color. So it's as it came out the cask, including the little black bits, but there we go. Um, the clean, I saw that they, it had a very high alcohol content in it, all, all three whiskeys. So nobody's driving home. This is Brickladdy. So this is the distillery that Jim McEwen, Mark Rainier, they took from the ashes and they decided to recreate. So they said, we're going to make a Brickladdy. So it's still hanging on the side of my glasses, we'd say. Still hanging on the edges there. Have a smell. See what you can do. Don't go straight into the glass or your eyes will fall out. It's quite strong, as Rachel says. We're at six, what are we in this one? We are at 60.9%. So this has lost about 8% of the alcohol over the last uh, 12 years it's been in the cask. Comes off the still at about 68%. So have a smell. You will get a hit of alcohol if you go quite deep in. So just start a bit lower and then come up to it. Any thoughts? It's all great me yakking on all day, but I'm sure there's thoughts in there. Do we like it? I always say that. And, you know, It's really, it's really strange because obviously ILA whiskey, you know, Lafroig, and all the ones we mentioned before are very peaty, but this this is it's the same with the classic laddie. It's not it's not smoky from either. Is that is that just a strange thing, or does it make it more unique? That was the tradition of Brickladdy. Isla is traditionally a peated malt. Mm. When distilleries malted their own barley, they would do it locally, obviously. And Isla has very few trees because they've all blown away, but has a lot. <laughs> So they were taking the peat from the island to smoke the barley. Brookladdy, though, had always imported, or at least modern times, had, had brought their malted barley in. So it was classically an unpeated malt. So Brunehaven and, and Brookladdy were classically unpeated islas. And when they reopened the distillery, they were told, this isn't an isla whiskey. This isn't a traditional isla. This is not what an isla whiskey should be. And they got really this sort of fed up with that as an attitude because it was, it had been its whole days. And they created two other brands in the same distillery, which again had never been done. And they were told they couldn't do. And they went, well, we've done it, so we can, and we did. And they created Port Charlotte, which is peated to 40 parts per million, which we'll come to. And they created Optimore, which is peated to, its peak was over 300 parts per million and average is over a hundred. 
Lafroig, I think, is 55 parts per million. Ardbeg, yeah. 40 yeah. parts per million. Yeah. So this is this is extreme. This and this is Jim and Mark just telling the world we'll do what we want. You know, we can do this because it's our distillery. Again, it's that it's that lightly toasted barley. It's that lightly malted barley rather than the quite heavy ones. When you when you when you think of a whiskey in a in a picture, it's usually quite dark. So that's usually had a sherry influence. That have a much more fruity Christmas cake, at apricots, raisins, that sort of thing. So it's a lovely. Jim would call this a, an everyday drinking dram, a five o'clock dram. You know, this is not something you can just <laughs> think about and be it's kind of like in the moment. Well, it's been locked down, so I think we're all used to a, a five o'clock drink, aren't we? So. <laughs> well, well <laughs> just me then. So. <laughs> I'm not that early. And is this one, um, you talked about grain and malt blend. Yeah. Grain or malt or blend or? Yeah, absolutely. Well, grain whiskey is a constitute of blended whiskey. So grain whiskey is made from non-malted barley. So it's not made of barley, it's made of beans and it's another thing. So it is also produced in what's called a column still. So basically just a cylinder that is completely yeah. distilling. Where a hot still is that, when you think of whiskey, you think of that lovely hourglass shape. And that's what malt whiskey goes into. So a, a blended whiskey, a traditional blended whiskey, Johnny Walker, famous grouse, bells, whatever, will have a balance of grain and malt, depending on the premium nature, more malt. Whiskey, single malt whiskey is just single malt. It has to be from the same distillery and has to be of at least the age that's on the bottle. So single cask gives you, whether it's single cask grain or it's, and you get old grains. I mean, we bottled a 35 year old Invergordon, which is a grain whiskey just before Christmas, which was fantastic. That real Christmassy fruity sherry flavor to it. At five years old, it would have been just would have been paint strip. But that 35 years of wood and sherry and that kind of breathing and all that, changes it you know as my father who does live in space i'd said it's ridiculous that we make something and 10 years later thanks to american bourbon french oak and spanish sherry actually tastes pretty good so <laughs> there we go i'm going to move on to number two just because it's, it's a good one to compare with here okay again we are sticking with brooklady all the whiskies tonight are distilled at brooklady but this third one will be a port charlotte so again we're not talking about peated malt here we're talking about unpeated malt. This one's 13 years old. Mike's just taking a sniff and agrees. This is a good one. <laughs> this is Colin, completely different. We've got, we've got so, these little uh, jugs of water. Now, when, when should you and when shouldn't you be putting water in your whiskey? The question is, when should I have said that? And that was three minutes ago. Uh, <laughs> so we'll do that in a minute. Uh, well spotted. So bear in mind with this one, this is still Brookladdy. So the same whiskey you had before. Same malting, same distillery, same peating. This one is one year older, but is completely different in color. So you see on my screen there, you can tell I'm the host because I'm not drinking. You've got the, the bourbon cask here, and this time we've got a, bur a red wine Bordeaux cask. So that color completely comes from the cask. So as I said, all whiskey goes in clear. So it's been in the cask a year longer than the last one, but obviously been in a different cask. So again, we'll do a little trick to see if it's chill filtered or not. I can spoil the surprise, it's not chill filtered. So it's natural color. Again, whiskey's on the shelf, standard production, totally elite, totally legal, totally allowed. They can put what's called E150 in, which is a basically a caramel coloring, so that when you go to the supermarket to buy your whiskey, it's always the same color. These will all, single cask whiskeys will always be different. Not always as noticeable as this, but will always be different. So this has spent its whole life in a red wine cask. A lot of cask, uh, red wine casks you see are only finished in a red wine cask. So maybe in there for six months, six weeks, and just take on some color and flavor. This has spent 13 years doing that. So again, not that water really changes the, uh, the taste of it. It has quite a, quite a punch when you have it neat. <laughs> I won't say it waters it down because that's the wrong words to use. But it just, it, it mellows it out. That's nice. It opens it up a bit. And that's the thing with, with single cask and cask strength whiskey. If you buy, say, an Abelard 10 year old or a Glen Farkless 10 year old, they've taken it to a point it, for the bottling that is going to be most appealing to most palates. This is your opportunity to do that. When you get your fish supper, you put your salt and vinegar on. I don't. You know what you want. That right. So it's, it's all about that. And again, I love this one. This is absolutely a favorite of mine. These wine casks add so much. The genius with, with Brooklady was. 
because Mark Rainey and his colleagues were wine merchants, they knew all the wine chateaus, the best first growths in France. They were using casks from Petrus, from Latour, from Haubryon. They were using Yakems. They were using things that just, you know, the bottles of, bottles of wine are thousands of pounds. The casks are, are amazing. So those are the flavors that are imparting in these. This is, this is a first fill Bordeaux. As I say, it's 61.8%. Jim again. And again, there's no answers. We don't, you know, if you like it, I'm pleased. If you don't like it, we go to the next one. We've only got one more, so you've got to like I think, I think for me, though, Colin, with it, it's, it's all, it's, I mean, the word complex is completely right. There are so many base notes that are in there that are all kind of, for me, all the base notes are almost clashing against each other. And I'm not sure for me, personally, whether that works. But I think with the, with the water, it does, again, it, it, it adds, it, it opens it up a little bit. And you can almost separate those base notes a little bit from, from when you're tasting it. But without them, it's almost like a big kind of clash. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's a like stream a of flavor. It, yeah, no, you need the water. At the same time. We, you know, it's, it's interesting, certainly. People say there's no wrong way to drink whiskey. And then we always caveat that with, but don't put ice in it. Um, but it opens it up. What ice, what ice does is ice is cold, obviously it contracts the flavors. If you think if you jump into you put your hand in some icy water, you, you tense up. That's what the flavors are doing. Water, just at room temperature, will will open those flavors up. They'll make them more. And again, it's finding that balance for your palate, you know, on which note the spectrum changes. So we're staying with Brooklady Distillery, but we'll go to dram number three. So this is 2007 again. So we're 13 years old when it was bottled. Um, and is Port Charlotte. So again, from Brooklady, but Port Charlotte. So this is a peated malt. This is what we would call a medium to heavy peated malt. And this will be about 40, 40 parts per million phenols. So once you malt the barley, you can test the barley to see how much of the smoke has gone into the malt, how much of the peat influence has gone into the barley. The longer and lower heat you smoke the, the barley, the more smoke flavour is going to be held within it. If it's warm, the outside, the husks of the barley just harden up and cook, and then the smoke can't get in. So it's a very traditional Isle of Malt. This. So coming back to Phil's point that the Brooklady wasn't a traditional because it wasn't smoky, absolutely right. This is a very traditional Isle of Malt. Port Charlotte Distillery doesn't exist anymore, but is about two miles, less than that actually, a mile from Brooklady, and they decided to reopen the brand, not the distillery, but reopen the brand, recreate that malt. So just have a smell, they say don't go too deep in, and if you've got anything from before to compare, particularly Dram 1, have a go. You get a totally different smell off this. You get that peaty fire, that you know, the background of the campfires and burning wood and things, completely different. It's like Lagavulin. Exactly. Lagavulin, <laughs> 50. Very much like Lagavulin. Yeah, so you've got that traditional Isla characteristic mm. spot on. Lagavulin would be considered right in the middle of that tradition. Yeah. It's not overpowering, but it's there. So again, it's non-chill filtered. It's strong again. We're at 59.4%. So it probably will want some water. That'll probably smooth out the, the, the smoke a wee bit and maybe open up some other flavors, fruitiness, nuttiness, maltiness, things like that. So and you've got that kind of that that classic kind of medicinal kind of edge to it. Yeah. Which I think is, is something that a lot of people point out with that kind of peaty kind of style of whiskey. One distillery, all these come from the same distillery, from the same mash, from the same, the same team making it. And the casks can, can have such a difference to it. It's absolutely amazing that, that you can have that balance and you can have that change. And, and people either love or hate smoky whiskies. I was expecting more kind of like, well, kind of on screen there for a moment, but there's there's a real love-hate relationship. But it's um, not as in your face as a Lafroy. That That's the thing. It really, yeah. I mean, with Lafroy, you've got basically you know three tons of you know nhs ward and with this you've got you know it, it's uh it, it, there's a lot less in your face but you can taste it all but it's not as bang it's yeah. um that there's a, a lot more subtlety to it this is delicious it's mm. very very nice Craig, can i ask a question in relation to my business which is selling safes and keeping things secure um Given that these are now collectible, how do you store these? And given that they have such high value now, are people getting targeted and having their collections stolen because they're such a good value? I mean, how, how, can, how can you um, 
with, with a piece of jewellery, it's it's recognisable unless it gets broken up, of course. But with a bottle, unless it has something on it that identifies that it was mine or yours or whoever's, could it just go to anyone? Difficult one. I've not heard of any targeted thefts, but I don't think we could be far from that. You know, you see yeah. the value of these things. Lots of the bottles that you get have um, are numbered. So, for example, that is number 248 of 265. So if that came up, it could be identified. Um, but again, if it's a targeted theft, maybe these things have got a, a home to go to already. The yeah. storage aspect is very different from wine. You don't want to, wine, obviously, you want to keep on its side to keep the cork wet. Whiskey, you don't want to do that. You want to keep the bottle standing up. Yeah. The hole can eat away at the seal between the cork and, and the top. You want to, if you're in the cupboard once every few months, you just want to give it a dash down so it doesn't dry out totally, but yeah. you don't want that contact all the time. Ideally, you want them in quite a constant environment. Um, so in bright sunlight that's going up and down isn't great because whiskey has space in the bottle because alcohol and liquid expands and contracts. So you don't want to be putting too much pressure on the seals, particularly on, on older bottles, which arguably weren't designed to be kept. So lots of people have their sort of whiskey room or their, their bar or, or, or their kind of little, little man cave and things. And that, um, that would be, you know, usually hidden from view. But equally, these things are valuable. They must be becoming targets for theft. And they're sold in such quantities now. There's auctions, there's dealers for these things. Every day of the week, these things are being sold. So to finding them would be very yeah. difficult. It's, it's not, you know, if a Rolex Daytona gets sold, and goes to an auction, you can trace that you can trace the seal number. There are not many day donors on the market at the time, whereas there can be many, many bottles of Macallan 25 years because the market is so active. Can I, can I ask you about the, the market? Um, going back to wine, because I know a little bit about that. <clears throat> back in the day, when looking at wine investments, apparently the market on Prima starts at one level, then it dips over time. And then it firms back up again as the drinking time arrives. And, and, and of course, those who are selling wine as an investment, you know, talk about vintage years and, you know, whether it should be the 2005 or the 2006, all those sort of interesting things. Whiskey is obviously different. And as we're just talking about, whiskey might be coming into fashion right now um, or was already in fashion. Um, and who knows when that fashion will end or whether it's a fashion at all. But if you were going to be advising, I'm sure you do, advise people about, well, this one for 10 years, if you're looking at a 10-year investment window, what would you, if you had the spare cash and you were a punter, not as expert as you are, um, what would you sort of suggest the average punter go out and just, if they want to sort of slice this market? Sure. I think... As with any market, whether it's paintings or cars or wine or watches, you, you have to look at what, what is wanted and why. So you want to go for as top a brand as you can and understand within that brand what's wanted. So taking Rolex watches as an example, gents Rolex watches are far more wanted than ladies Rolex watches. So if you're investing in Rolex, you buy the gents and you keep it in the box and you keep the papers. It's with the whiskey, you find that brand. So you look at people like McAllen are very big. Uh, Lefroy is very popular. Beaumore, Springbank, uh, things like that. Glenfarclas are the kind of blue chip ones. And then within that, you think, well, what, what is it that they're doing that is the best? So with any product, it's the best that will go up the most or down the least. And it's what can you what level of best can you afford the, the the whiskies we're drinking tonight that are from jim McEwen's collection they come to it in a different way they've got the provenance of being jim's who is an isla legend he is as i said he's like a world cup winning 1966 football player to these guys you know this is this is what he is they're his whiskies so there's that provenance they're all single cask non-chill filtered limited edition and there are no more of them so once they're gone, they are gone. McCallum can always produce more 25-year-olds or more 30-year-olds. They've just released a 70, 72, and 78-year-old that they're going to do on a rolling basis. So that they have the stock that they can repeat that. Single cask bottlings, limited editions, can't be repeated because of their very nature. They are independently bottled, so they're not bottled by the distillery. So that puts them into a different category, so it's harder to quantify the value. So the because there are less of them and they're not repeated. So it's perhaps arguably a slightly riskier investment, 
but in a sense it maybe has a higher return because it has those different marker points that could, could be of interest to clients. But you're protecting yourself because you've got single cask, limited edition, non-chill filtered, cask strength, Jim McEwen, great story. So things like that have a good value. But just going out and buying any limited edition bottle from an independent bottler that sounds interesting isn't going to have the same return. So over my shoulder as well, there's uh, Klein Leash, which is a great distillery, 10 year old that uh, my colleague bottled a couple of years ago. I think it was 55, 60 pounds at the time. You could probably pick it up in auction for 40 or 50 pounds now. It's not got that run on effect because it's a standard production of a limited edition. Whereas the McEwen is a unique production of limited edition. So it's trying to find those threads, trying to find those things that are different, but tick the boxes of, of being, being good news. Um, I'm, I'm going to take a quick poll and then I'm going to ask you a very uncomfortable question. So, so gentlemen, um, wh whose favourite was the first one? So, so number one, if you just raise your hand, if it, that was your favourite. OK, so we've got one, two, three, four, five. And put your hands up if, if the second one was your favourite. We've got three there. And if the last one was your favourite, Dram three. We've got one, two. OK, so three, including me, because that was mine. So Dram one, Colin, the uh, Brutal Eddy... 2008 20 years time what's it going to be worth <laughs> more than it is now <laughs> <laughs> the answer is i don't know and that's one of those questions that is impossible but what i would say is these none of these whiskies have been released to the market yet you are among the first people to try these these are being released um there's a launch auction which begins tomorrow and that's to try and get some hype around them and to get some new collectors and new buyers, and they'll go on general release next week. That first one you tried, the Brookladi uh, bourbon cask, will be £225 a bottle. We're already having people, uh, there was a shop uh, called up yesterday who we vaguely know, but phoned up as our best friend all of a sudden, as if we'd gone to school together. Oh, great to hear from you guys. How are you? These Brookladis, I'm going to need 20 of all of them. And I said, well, we're not doing trade discount. We're only doing business to client. And he said, oh, right, um, that's all right. I'll be able to sell them for more. And he hadn't asked the price and wanted 20 of them all. So my instinct is within six weeks, not 10 years, these will be more than they are when they come out. Now, don't quote me on that. I'm not guaranteeing it. If you invest in them, that's great. But you can drink them at the end of the day. But at the end of the day, these are not going to be repeated. Jim's casks, Brookladdy now don't sell single cask whiskey to the open market. They bottle their own. So it's getting rarer in that sense. Isla is getting ever more popular. There seems to be a real taste for, for the Isle of Tradition and the smoky whiskies as well. So that's a good sign. And the market itself is expanding. There's there's no there, there's signs of it of it slowing in part, but not not it's not a bubble that's going to burst. It's you know, we I think it's a new asset class that's here to stay, uh, and it's a new collectible that's here to stay as well. And there'll be ups and downs as there is with anything, but you know, if you pitch in at these right markers, these are the markers, um, then it's it's all good news. Fantastic that auction. The auction is to, it starts tomorrow, I think, at 1 p.m. It is whiskeyauctioneer.com. And as you say, the last one was uh, was phenomenal with some world breaking record breaking prices. So I hope I hope, Colin, that we uh, see some fantastic prices from your end as well. <laughs> bit Light of, bit pressure between now and Monday to do that, but we'll get there. <laughs> Colin, I really, really can't thank you enough for all of the time and effort you put into this evening. I'm sure all the other gentlemen on yeah. on the call thank really do appreciate it. Um, yeah. It's been absolutely fascinating, and. Uh, your 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 knowledge is just unbelievable. If I'm if I'm being totally honest, and it's, uh, it's I had three really steps, not three drams. After three drams, it makes so much sense. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I hope everyone else has really enjoyed the evening, and thank you ever so much, gentlemen, for for joining mm -hmm. me this evening, and and Rachel, obviously, um, and uh, we, we hope to see you all soon.